We speak a lot about the music industry, but I personally have some unanswered questions. Like, what is the music industry? Who is the one making all of these standards and decisions? And at what point did music become a business? Let's explore together, but definitely grab a coffee or a snack for this one because it's a long one. Hi everyone, and welcome to Music Theories, where I explain and analyze all topics related to music. Be sure to subscribe for more content, especially if you're a music geek like me. Don't forget to check out some of the other videos on my channel as well. I have a playlist of music fundamentals for learning music, as well as a lot of fun lists. I think it's important to note as I begin that the history and the industry I'm referring to in this video are specific to Western culture as I'll be beginning in Europe and ending in America. It's worth mentioning that my videos on music distribution, and specifically my video on Tin Pan Alley, are great precursors to getting the most out of this video. They're certainly not required to understand the content, but definitely enhances the experience. If you've watched my video series on the evolution of music distribution, you'll remember we discussed the ways by which music was consumed throughout the years. Much of the music before the 15th century was either passed down through word of mouth or it was copied by hand. Prior to the invention of the printing press, music had to be hand copied, which was both expensive and time consuming. Therefore, printed music was either a necessary task undertaken by religious figures, such as monks and priests, or it was a symbol of status. What I mean by that is, only the wealthiest of people could afford to pay someone to copy music. So aristocrats often had libraries of their favorite music, which actually eventually served as important sources for preservation of secular music. However, with the invention of the printing press, a new industry was born. Music publishing. The printing press allowed for sheet music to be printed quickly and cost-effectively, which resulted in music being spread across the continent of Europe, beginning in the Renaissance period. The first entity to hold a monopoly on music was Ottaviano Petrucci, who held much of the music printed in Venice, which at the time was the center of music publishing. He basically had exclusive copies of some of the most popular Renaissance composers. I'm skipping a lot of details to get to my point, but... Basically, the invention of printed music in the 15th century changed the world of music forever in one huge way. It shrunk the class gap. Like I was saying before, music was only accessible to those who could afford the copyist or the performer. It was, in many ways, a symbol of status. But with the ability to essentially mass-produce sheet music, it was suddenly accessible to the lower class to learn. This widened the audience of composers who were previously reliant on the wealthy class to fund their music careers. I want to point out how this changed the course of Western music. For a large part of history of Western music, the rich were deciding who was good and who was worthy of being remembered. This is still present in our music industry today, but we'll get there. It also gave middle-class non-musicians the opportunity to learn music from great composers, who, in turn, were able to make a profit teaching people how to read and play music. However, the ruling class wasn't going to let go of control that easily. In a lot of places, the right to print music was granted by the monarch or the ruling party, who would often only bestow that right upon those who they considered to be great and worthy. In the U.S., the success of printed intellectual property, even aside from music, led to the legislation of the Copyright Act of 1831. Copyright itself is something that's extremely complicated, but all you need to know moving forward is that copyright is what gave publishing companies the authority to charge what they did for printed music, and eventually what allowed record companies to charge what they did for recorded music. In the 19th century, the music publishing industry hit a boom, especially in the United States. Similar to the 15th century, the music publishing boom in the 19th century brought music to the living rooms of the middle class. This was dubbed parlor music, 
and was incredibly popular in the world before recorded music. Copyright laws being heavily enforced thanks to companies like Disney, coupled with the demand for printed music, allowed industries like Tin Pan Alley to take off. That is, until recorded music came into play. Long story short, the recorded music industry completely overtook the printed music industry. Within the record industry were different music labels who acted as companies that created and distributed music. You're probably aware that labels still exist today. Enter the RIAA. The year is 1952. Right off the bat, if you look up this organization, there isn't a lot of information about their formation or their history. It's a little sus, to be honest. But what we know is the original intent of this company. The RIAA, which stands for the Recording Industry Association of America, is a trade association, which is an organization founded and funded by businesses that operate in a specific industry. The primary function of a trade industry is for companies to collaborate with each other. This includes things like advertising, publishing, lobbying, and political donations, among other things. But in 1952, the RIA's main mission was to administer the copyright fees, deal with trade unions, and do research on the market of recorded music. It was made up of all the major labels in the U.S., but most importantly, the big five of this era. Capitol Records, Columbia Records, Decca Records, Mercury Records, and RCA Victor. Side note, if you'd like to see a video on what record labels actually do and how they work, let me know. In 1954, they invented what's known as the RIA curve, which quickly became the standard for recorded music. Without getting too much into it, it was basically the process by which music was recorded, which affected the way it was played back. It more or less improved the quality of recorded music by more closely replicating what was being played in the studio through this specific process of equalization, or EQ. If you'd like to see a video on the RIA curve, let me know. In 1958, the RIA launched the Gold Awards program, which was created to honor artists, and set a commercial standard for success in the music marketplace. In other words, they would give someone a trophy for selling over 500,000 copies of a song or record. The first gold award ever given was to Perry Como for his song Catch a Falling Star. The first gold album award was presented to Rodgers and Hammerstein for their musical Oklahoma. The RIAA site actually has a comprehensive list of all of the artists who've been presented with these awards. I've linked it below if you're interested. By the time the explosive disco era rolled around, the gold standard just wasn't enough. So Rhea introduced the Platinum Awards program, which was awarded to someone who sold over 1 million units of an album or single. The first to receive this award was the Eagles in 1976 for their Greatest Hits album. However, over 50 albums received the award that same year. Soon after, the music industry was doing so well that albums were being dubbed multi-platinum, which means that every million they sell, they're given another award. So you have albums like Pink Floyd's The Wall, which has been certified 23 times platinum since its release in 1979 ironically enough. ACDC's Back in Black, which has been certified 22 times platinum since its release in 1980, or Michael Jackson's Thriller, which has been certified 33 times platinum since its release in 1982. In 1999, music sales were so through the roof they needed to come up with a third tier of music sale awards, the Diamond Award. This award highlights the sale of over 10 million units of a song or album. Santana achieved this standard in one year with their 1999 album, Supernatural. But here's the kicker about this award. Let's say you're a producer of the album Supernatural. Your work has just sold over 10 million copies, which will mostly be paid out to the label that you work for. You get the call, you're certified Diamond. What an incredible accomplishment you need to buy your award. 
the actual plaque that you hang on the wall will cost you $450 per certification. After all the money you've already made for the RIAA, you have to buy your own award. Oh yeah, and they're made of plastic. But I digress. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know what comes next. Let's discuss what this means for music as an industry, but also music as an art. On a surface level, it appears the RIAA is a good thing. It seems true enough that someone should be protecting the rights of an artist's intellectual work, right? But upon deeper analysis, that's not actually what the RIA is doing. They're essentially upholding this system I spoke of earlier, where the wealthy decide what is good or worthy of being remembered. Let me elaborate. It's hard to break this down into specific numbers since the copyright law and royalties are incredibly complicated and specific to each copyrighted piece of work. It's important to note that over the years, copyright law has gotten increasingly more strict. This is largely in part to the Walt Disney Company lobbying to pass the Copyright Act of 1976, and later the Copyright Extension Act of 1998. This was in order to keep Steamboat Willie and Mickey Mouse out of the public domain, even though Disney's success is built off works they interpreted from the public domain. The music industry is no different. They often use copyright law as an excuse to have exclusive rights to someone else's work, even if that work is being used legally, also known as fair use. However, this isn't a video about copyright, so just keep that in mind as we move forward. The RIAA's mission, according to their site, is to work to protect artists' creative freedom and promote the unique work that labels do to support them. It's up to all of us to safeguard the creative values of artists' work. ASCAP's website states that, on average, roughly 10-15% to 15 of royalties are given to the recording artist. So where does the rest of that money go? Well, in 2022, the RIAA spent just shy of $5.4 million on lobbying. Lobbying is a legal act of persuading or influencing the actions, policies, or decisions made by government officials, often by way of bribery or influence peddling. The money spent on this was always high for the RIAA, but it shot through the roof after the Napster issue in 1999, and the RIA made it their main mission to protect their labels from the piracy running rampant on the internet. Let's take a look at the rhetoric created around music piracy. I won't go into extreme detail here since I've already done that in my video on the digital era of music distribution. Piracy from the perspective of the RIAA is described as pure theft. And to be clear, I'm not saying it's not. Their website goes into extreme detail outlining basic copyright law and providing a list of places where you can stream and download music legally. And by legally, they mean sites that directly benefit them. Let's take a look at the year 2007, since that was a huge turning point for the RIAA. That year, they spent $21 million in legal fees to sue individuals for copyright infringement, in addition to the $3.5 million spent on investigative services to bring in a whopping $515,929 in settlement fees. So financially, their campaign to protect artists' rights was a disaster. This was an attempt over many years to elicit fear into the public to stop the rate of file sharing on the internet. This included SWAT teams, questioning elementary school students to nab their parents, draining life savings and college funds of working-class people, and eventually threatening to wipe the hard drives of anyone with any MP3 files that might be stolen. But clearly, it didn't work well enough. On top of that, the settlement money wasn't even going to the artists, so what's the point? They emphasize the importance of protecting an artist's work, but what's funny is that the verbiage they use never says anything about making sure an artist gets paid. The RIA is not concerned with their artist's integrity. They're concerned with someone besides them 
profiting off an artist's creative work. And this is an issue that's multifaceted. They aren't protecting the artists, they're protecting the labels, which at this point were threatening to dissolve the trade association altogether for costing them so much money. And so they switched up their approach. In 2007, the RIA also spent $2.08 million on lobbying for three major pieces of legislation. Number one, the Pro-IP Act. Number two, the Intellectual Property Enforcement Act. And number three, the College Opportunity and Affordability Act. Yeah, that last one feels random, but I'll explain in a minute. The Pro-IP Act was huge. If passed, it would create an entire department similar to the DEA, called the Office of the U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Representatives, which would be responsible for cracking down on copyright infringement, even by way of flying all the way to other countries. This would also increase the penalty for copyright and trademark infringement, allowing for seizures of equipment and fines of up to $450,000. There's a lot more that goes into this bill, so I've linked something below where you can read about it in its entirety. Their lobbying efforts worked, and this bill was passed. The second bill, the Intellectual Property Enforcement Act, involved outsourcing copyright infringement laws to the Department of Justice, which clearly saves them millions in legal fees every year. It also provided an increase in funding to the FBI for investigations of these crimes. This one failed to pass. And lastly, the College Opportunity and Affordability Act is a bill that is very dense, and hidden within it was an addendum to require colleges to make plans to implement copyright filters on their networks and actively work to provide alternatives to file sharing. This bill was passed as well. Passing two out of three of these bills was a huge turning point for the RIAA, mostly because it took the financial burden of pursuing copyright infringement off of their shoulders and onto the government's. The RIAA continued to pursue other ways of preventing copyright infringement, even after these laws were put into effect. And they continue, even now, to lobby for even stricter copyright laws. Only a few years later, Spotify launched in the U.S. in 2011 and ushered in a new era of digital streaming. They posed this as a way to fight piracy, but it's really just glorified peer-to-peer file sharing that they profit off of. In this article from Music Business, the CEO of the RIAA, Mitch Glazer, discusses how the music industry has made an incredible comeback in the face of music piracy. By the middle of 2022, the RIAA already reported $7.7 billion in revenue from music distribution and streaming. Paid subscriptions hit a record high of 90 million users, totaling around $5 billion in paid subscriptions alone. I won't get into the breakdown of how much artists aren't paid through streaming services here, since I've done that previously in this video but I've linked this site down below that gives a great breakdown of how many streams one would need to meet the median wage in the U.S., which obviously is different per state and even per city, but spoiler alert, it's not enough. There are three major record labels in the United States. Universal Music, which makes up 32% of the market. Sony Music, which makes up 21% of the market. And Warner Music, which makes up 16% of the market. The remaining 31% is every small or indie label combined. In 2021, Universal Music reported a $9.4 billion revenue. That same year, Sony Music reported $8.9 billion and Warner Music reported $5.3 billion. Streaming has become so profitable for these labels that you may notice a few of them have spent significant money purchasing entire catalogs from some of the most popular acts, including Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Stevie Nicks, Whitney Houston, David Crosby, and many, many, many more. Universal alone actually spent $420 million on this in 2021, 
and a whopping $1.03 billion on catalog investments in 2020. If there wasn't money to be made from streaming, they wouldn't be spending that kind of money on catalogs. With these companies doing so well, artists thought it was a good time to ask for a raise since they're the ones providing the product. This, in and of itself, is a whole other topic. But there's one incident that sums up the whole thing pretty nicely. At an industry conference in 2019 called Sync Summit New York, Spotify executive, sometimes called Inventor, Jim Anderson was honored as a keynote speaker. One independent artist in attendance named Ashley Jaina presented the question on everyone's mind directly to Anderson. Why won't Spotify increase the rate per stream? She was suggesting a rate of one cent per stream, which at this point was an increase from the 0.3 cents per stream that Spotify was paying. In addition, other streaming sites like Apple Music were paying significantly more than Spotify. Anderson responded by calling Jaina and other artists entitled for asking for a higher rate. In the recording released by Jaina in 2021, he says, The problem is that Spotify was created to solve a problem. The problem was this, piracy and music distribution. The problem was to get artists' music out there, to solve a problem. The problem was not to pay people money. The problem, the problem was to distribute music, not to give you money, okay? The problem was to distribute music. This word, world right now we live in is built also on entitlement. Right now, today, everybody here in this younger world here, everybody seems to think about entitlement. It's not the same. What do you mean not the same? Entitlement is when you want more than is normal. Correct. We're getting le way less than normal. Well, you, you can read the whole conversation linked below and think what you want about it, but I personally think it's extremely telling. Now, it seems the music industry has been vigilant about concealing the annual income of its executives, since it's been under scrutiny for this for some time now. The last time Billboard reported on these figures was in 2015, but based on the numbers from 2013. In that year, according to Billboard, the CEO at the time was earning an annual income of $1.6 million, and on top of that, received a bonus of... $517,667. Our friend Mitch was also working there at the time, but as the senior executive vice president. His income reported that year was $776,616, along with a $125,000 bonus. Now, obviously, executives in positions such as these also benefit from the shares they hold within the company. So if these are the numbers just from the income in 2013, you can only imagine what these positions are making in 2022. And to me, making that much money off of the work that someone else created not only comes across as entitled, it sounds a lot like theft. Again, the RIAA is not interested in protecting the rights of their artists. They're interested in upholding the monopoly they've spent decades building. And there's a lot of evidence to support that copyright, the way they enforce it, may not be a good thing, even from a business perspective. Aside from that, legally, fair use is supposed to be granted in cases such as criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research because, you know, free speech. However, these factors are never reviewed or even taken into consideration on platforms like YouTube, where music is automatically pulled from any video for violating copyright laws. But again, this isn't necessarily a video about copyright, so we won't get into that. Of course, the problem is very complicated, and the solution is not so simple either. It's true that it's easier now than it's ever been to create music independently, 
but that doesn't mean it's feasible for people to compete with the industry giant that is the RIAA. Since the RIA has spent these decades also convincing people that their product is the standard, and creating awards that symbolize how much money they've exploited artists for. It's also important to mention that these standards they've created have disproportionately affected people of color since these labels were established. Minorities have been heavily exploited throughout the history of American music, but that's a topic we'll continue to explore and discuss together. There are people fighting the RIAA, though they're not very well known. They argue the right to fair use that the RIA often infringes upon. In 2006, the Consumer Electronics Association, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Public Knowledge, and the Media Access Project launched the Digital Freedom Campaign. They described their mission as follows. Digital technology enables literally anyone and everyone to be a creator, an innovator or an artist, to produce music to create cutting-edge videos and photos, and to share their creative work. Digital technology empowers individuals to enjoy these new works when, where, and how they want, and to participate in the artistic process. These are basic freedoms that must be protected and nurtured. The Digital Freedom Campaign is dedicated to defending the rights of students, artists, innovators, and consumers to create and make lawful use of new technologies free of unreasonable government restrictions and without fear of costly and abusive lawsuits. Former CEO Carrie Sherman's response to this in 2006 was as follows. To seize the mantra of consumer rights to advance that business interest is simply disingenuous. And to do it at the expense of creators' right to be compensated for their work is short-sighted. Ironic, considering he was making at least $1.6 million a year in 2015. I'm aware that this take is a controversial one, but on music theories, I think it's important to think about the future of music and what it might look like. I encourage you to read more about these things outside of the video and form your own opinion on the matter. The right to digital freedom continues to be more and more limited, even beyond music, but that's beyond the scope of this channel. Of course, it's not easy standing up to the RIAA. The Digital Freedom Campaign's domain was bought out and now redirects you to New England Honda dealers. Happy Honda Days, by the way. The Consumer Electronics Association is now a trade association, and the Media Access Project was suspended in 2012 due to lack of funding. However, some organizations still continue their fight to give everyone the right to create, and if you're interested in getting involved, I've linked their sites below. Just like the ruling classes in Europe centuries ago, the RIAA also decides what is good and what is worthy of being remembered, by convincing the public that an artist isn't good if they aren't signed to a major label. The best artists go platinum and win Grammys, and... If you dream of being an artist, that's what you should be working towards, or you're probably not any good. It's not based on talent, skill, passion, or any of those things. It's based on how marketable and exploitable an artist is, as an individual and as a product, and maximizing profit on said product. I'll stop myself here since there's a whole lot to say on these topics, but all that said, I want to know what you think. Again, I encourage you to read the sources yourself and decide what you think, since this topic is pretty dense and complicated. But as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.